Hey guys, welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig, it's nine o'clock, it's a Friday, and I've got a very special video for you. For those of you that don't know, I have an online streaming platform called The Net Tricks, and there's three levels. Uh, bronze is all the tricks and all of the slights and everything. Uh, gold is where I have my mentoring group, and I meet up with them on um, private mentoring sessions on Zoom twice a week. And the silver level, is uh is uh there's a bunch of perks but one of the big perks is uh we do weekly vmcs uh, which is a virtual magic club where we meet every single week and we talk about various different subjects uh they're all themed to different subjects and we do master classes once a month as well with big name creators and um uh yeah they're super fun they're all recorded and they're all in the archives so when you join the net tricks you get access to every single vmc right from day one and there's some amazing stuff there well, uh, it's the new year now, it's 2024, and it's the time where a lot of people make goals. New year, new start, you know, that sort of thing. And we did a VMC in the Netrix just before New Year's Day, where I gave some advice on goal setting. I am very big on goal setting. I'm very big on uh, targets and, and being target driven and so on and so forth. Very, very big on that sort of thing. And so what we've actually done is we're going to play you that VMC. So we're going to actually play you the VMC from um, the uh, from the Netrix. So you can actually watch the entire thing. If you're planning on making any goals for 2024, if you're planning on, on, on setting any targets for 2024, this is absolutely the video you want to watch. So we don't very often let people have a sneak peek behind the curtain when it comes to the Netrix, but we are today. Uh, this is uh, this is the VMC all about goal setting. Uh, if you want to join the Netrix, go to www.thenetrix.com. That's www.thenetrix.com. You can sign up for a month, see what the fuss is about. Everybody's doing it. Happy New Year. I hope you have some great goals that you hit this year. And this is the Netrix. So I, I, I always, when I do the VMCs, I normally make them centered around magic because I don't know how interesting talking about business is to people. I like to try to pepper them in there sometimes because I love talking about business and marketing probably as much as if not more than I like talking about magic. Um, so I do like to have these. Uh, and I might do more of them next year. I don't know. I haven't decided yet. I'm kind of looking at how I'm going to do things and which what we're going to be doing. But um, uh, I wanted to do this one because obviously tomorrow's New Year's Eve. So we're at the end of 2023. And normally this is where people make goals. And people make New Year's resolutions. And for years, I made New Year's resolutions. And by about the third week of January, I had just thrown away every single New Year's resolution that I made and just gone, fuck it. Um, and I think that a lot of people kind of have that same thing. And one thing that we try to do within Nonstop Kids and Slightly Unusual and Magic TV is we try to set goals and and and, and actually hit them. And, and I think that making sure that you're you're making goals and making sure that you're you're making targets, uh, I, I think it really can help. I mean, it's it's probably the biggest thing that helped me. When I, I mean, you guys all know my story. I dicked around for almost all of my life because Sarah was a full time teacher. Um, she was a deputy head in the school. She made really good money. So she basically kept me. I didn't have to do many gigs or do any high priced gigs or anything like that because I knew that Sarah's wage would keep us comfortable. And so I just sat at home um, spending the entire day cuddling up to the dogs and watching TV. Um, and, and then one day Sarah came home and said, hey, good news and bad news, bad news. Good news is I'm pregnant. Um, bad news is now you need to man up and actually make this magic thing work for you or you're gonna have to get a proper job. And, and it was kind of that moment in my life where everything changed and I realized I'm going to have to actually stop dicking around and actually start taking things seriously. And I did two things. The first thing I did is I quit magic. I didn't quit magic. I quit the magic community. I left the Wizard Product Review. I stopped creating tricks for magicians and I just focused 100% on my business. And then the other thing is I started looking into goal setting. Um and realized very early on, it's difficult to set goals 
unless you actually know where you are you don't know you can't you can't possibly know where you're going to be or where you want to be if you don't know where you are at the moment and i've had lots of business coaches throughout my life uh, or throughout the last few years uh, and i think we've got two different business coaches three different business coaches at the moment and they all talk about uh, about goal setting but uh, one is a guy called cross crossley and i think i've spoken about him before he calls himself the mindset technician and he's an expert at mindset and he always says um, go uh, having goals is so important. It's like uh, it's like if you're a captain of a ship, if you don't know where you're planning on going, if you have no destination, you're just going to be basically taking that ship and going round and round in circles and you're never going to get anywhere because you don't know where you need to go. So I realized very early on from a business point of view, I needed to learn and understand about setting goals. And I was getting a lot of information from everywhere. And I want to talk about some of that information for you. Talk about what's worked for me and what hasn't worked for me. Um, Cross, the same guy, Cross Crossley. Um, he talks about goal setting. He talks about having a, um, a he calls it a CMI, uh, a clear mental image. And, uh, and, and this is a big part of what Cross does. He talks about having a clear mental image. And, and, and what he means by that is, have an image in your of what you want to achieve in a year's time or two years time or three years time but make it as vivid and as strong as possible and when you go to a workshop with cross crossley he even goes to the point where he actually gives you a piece of paper and he sits you down and he gets you to draw where you want to be in two years time or a year's time or three years time or one year's time or whatever it is he, he's you know he, because he says you've got to have that clear mental image you've got to go you've got to know exactly where it is that you're going because if you don't know where you're going you're not going to get there right and I've got another business coach that worked with me for years called Doug Daubry and um, Doug always said that the big problem that a lot of business owners have when they make goals is they make them based on uh, finance or money so what I mean by that is your typical business person or your typical self-employed magician will say, I want to make £50,000 next year. That's my goal. I want to make £50,000 by the end of the year. I want to turn over £50,000. And uh, he said the problem with that is when you're running a business or when you're self-employed, it's never a clear path from here to here. If you're here and you want to be here, it doesn't do that. It goes up and down and up and down and up and down. And anybody who's run their own business or anybody who's self-employed or anybody who's an entrepreneur will know that one minute you can have the highest of highs and you can just be over the moon and something's happened that you're super excited about. And then the very next day, you're literally in the gutter. Um, and, and, and he says that um, when, when you're having ups and downs, when you have those down periods where everything feels like it's going wrong and we've all been there where we feel like, Oh my God, if you've been running a business long enough, you'll, 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 you'll be there where it's kind of like, Oh my God, I can't do this. I need to quit. When you're in that position, the thing that keeps you going, or at least for me, the thing that keeps me going is knowing what my goal is and money just isn't a big enough thing. You know, it's kind of like, it's like, okay, oh my God, I've just lost my biggest contract and, uh, uh, you know, I've, this has just happened and that's just happened and I've just had a complaint from this client. Oh my God, this is just a nightmare. Why am I even doing this? You know, to then kind of think to yourself, it doesn't matter because, you know, you're, you, you're going to make 50 grand this year isn't a big enough thing to pull you out of that mindset, right? Um, it just It just never is. So Doug always suggests working backwards, and what I mean by working backwards, very simply, is um, think about where you want your life in a year's time or two years time or three years time. And Doug always suggests three years. And the reason Doug always suggests three years is because he kind of says um, you need a long enough period to, to, to you know, if you, if you set your goals for six months time and they're not happening, you can tell very early on they're not happening and it's going to make you very despondent. If you set your goals for three years time or two years time, it's, it's a lot better. But regardless of when you set your goals for, 
Uh, he says that you want to set your goals as to what you want your dream life to be like at that point. And what I mean by that is, okay, so so what do you want your life to look like in three years' time? So you want a house. Okay, fantastic. You want a house. Uh, do you want a car? Do you want two cars? Okay, do you want to go on holiday? How many times a year do you want to go on holiday? Um, do you want... Uh, uh, a uh, you know how much disposable income do you want to have how many times do you want to go out or, you know you work all of this out you work out what your ideal life would be and then you work out how much it's going to cost for you to live your ideal life in three years time so in three years time I want to be here so if I want to be here how much money am I going to need in order to live that life how much do I need okay, I'm going to need this much a month. That's how much I'm going to have to have a month in order to live my perfect idyllic life. Okay, that's what I'm going to need in three years time. Okay, so how much is that a month? Right, in order to get there, if that's how much I need a month, how much am I making a month at the moment within my business? And we'll talk about this in a minute, but that's why it's so important to track stuff because you know it just really is. But how much are you making from your business right now? Okay, so this is how much I'm making for my business right now. This is how much I make. I want, I need to have in order to hit my my ideal goal. So now you kind of think, well, okay, in order to get there from here, how much am I going to need to make by the end of year one? How much am I going to need to make by the end of year two? And how much am I going to need to make at the end of year three? So now when you're getting ups and downs, it's not about money anymore. When you kind of hit the gutter and you're like, oh my God, this is this is not working, which is going to happen. It's it's going to happen. I've never met a business owner. I've never met somebody that's self-employed that's just been on the highest of highs. They started their business on day one. They immediately rocked it up here and they just carried on on that level the entire time. That's never happened. Remember, this is a statistic I've talked about on Magic TV. Remember, 80% of business owners um, fail within the first five years of opening their business. 80% of business owners fail within the first five years. And out of the 20% that succeed, only 20% actually go on to achieve their full potential, which means it's a tiny, infinitesimal amount of people actually go and achieve success. Um, and why is that? Why do so many people quit? Well, so many people quit because of various different factors, but one is overwhelm when the shit hits the fan and things go wrong they haven't got that image they don't know they can't think in their head okay i i want to be there and so they end up giving up and it happened over covid an awful lot you know how many magicians do you know that were full-time magicians they got themselves a, a, a job during covid and then when we came out of covid that didn't become full-time magicians anymore i know loads of people that dropped out hell i'll be honest with you I came close to dropping out of magic. COVID for me was just a really horrible situation. I mean, it was for everybody, but we were running a limited company, two limited companies. So we had to um, we, we had to furlough the staff, obviously, but we couldn't furlough ourselves. We had two options in order to keep the company running as we were, because we're paid directors of the company. We get paid by the company. We're not self-employed. The only way we could keep the companies running was by not furloughing ourselves. So we couldn't furlough ourselves. So instead, we had to, so we got no support from anybody at all. And I was doing like probably about 15 virtual shows a day just to keep the lights on, just to pay the bills. And even then we came out of it massively in debt. And and honestly, the amount of times during COVID that I just wanted to just like give up and go, you know what? It would be so much easier for me to go and get a job doing something else. Um so, you know, there's, there's probably about six times in my entire career that I felt like quitting, and that was the most recent time. Um, the point I'm saying to this is, why didn't I quit? The reason I didn't quit is because I had that clear mental image. I knew what I wanted to achieve, and I knew that by being employed by somebody, and I knew I could go out and get a job easily, anywhere. Um, I've been in sales my whole life. I could walk into a sales job, no problem. Um but, but you know, I, I didn't want to do that because I knew that no job in the world would allow me to hit the goals that I wanted to hit. The only thing that would allow me to hit those goals would be by being self-employed and running my own business. 
um and 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 every single day i was thinking about that clear mental image every single day i was thinking about where i wanted my life to be and i was thinking well this is a hiccup you know i'm locked in my house i can't leave the house uh, my business is crumbling around me and i'm going more into debt every single day but it doesn't matter because i know i'm going to end up ultimately being where i want to be right and uh, and that's and that's true and now now things are great but it took a while to get there so the point i'm trying to make is you have to have a clear mental image. You have to work out where your life you want it to be. And then you use, you work out what you need your business to do in order to get to where you want it to be. The other thing that I would say, and I'm going to ask you guys to, uh, to ask any questions that you've got while I'm talking about this as well. Um, but the other thing that I would say is there's that old expression, which I'm sure you've heard, which is uh, shoot for the moon. And if you don't hit it, you're going to you're going to reach the stars. Right. And a lot of people ban that that saying around, but they don't really understand fully what it means. What it means is you want your goals that you make to be aspirational. I say aspirational. I don't you don't want to make them ridiculous. You don't want to go, well, by the end of 2024, I want to be a multimillionaire. And uh, I want to own 15 properties and I'd like to be married to Jennifer Garner. You know, like it's probably not going to happen. Right. Um, unfortunately. Uh, but, you know, you, you <laughs> I wish. Um, but, you know, you, you, you want to make them aspirational. And the reason is, and I always do this analogy when I'm booked to be a motivational speaker. I always do this, which is um, I, I, I talk about goal setting or having a goal is a little bit like standing on a garage roof. I want you to imagine that you, you, you've you got a garage um, and, and it overlooks your yard, or your back garden. And in your yard, there's a big tree and there's two branches on the tree. There's an upper branch and there's a lower branch. And you want to jump off this garage roof and you want to land in the in the tree. You have two options. You can either grab the bottom branch or you can grab the top branch. Now, if you put all of your time and efforts and you really focus on grabbing the bottom branch, well, you might grab it, you might not. But if you don't grab that bottom branch, what's going to happen and you miss it, you're going to fall on your ass. You're going to end up on the floor. But if you aim for the top branch and you put all of your efforts into trying to get that upper branch, that higher branch, you might not hit it, but you're definitely going to be able to grab the lower one on the way down because you've aimed higher. So you've reached a higher point than you would have done if you'd aimed for the lower branch. So even when you're setting your goals, even if you don't hit the, the, the big goal, even if you don't hit the, um, you know, the huge, even if you don't hit the, uh, the, the huge goal, you're going to be better off than you would have been if you just settled for a smaller goal. And I see a lot of people doing that. I want to, uh, I want to, uh, I want to have, you know, whatever. Um, well, I'll give you a perfect example. Okay, so perfect example. So at the beginning of the year, and this is true, I can give you this example because it's on my phone. So I'm going to show you my phone here. Let me just turn the brightness down. Um, I have my goals everywhere. So I have a goals board in my office and stuff. But I have it on my phone as well. You can get these little post-it note things that you put on your phone. And I'll show you one goal that's on the home page of my phone. So going into 2023, I think we had just under 10,000 subscribers on Magic TV. I think it was 10,000. It took me two years to get to that point, but I think we had 10,000 subscribers. And uh, I wanted to try and get more subscribers. And I set myself a goal. And you can see it here. It's been on my phone all year. 20,000 uh, subs by the end of 2023. Now, I haven't hit that. Um, I am currently sitting on... Um, 18,509. I'm telling you right now, I'm a much further along than I would have been if I'd set my goal at 15,000. Would I have hit 15,000? Yeah, and I might have took my, my foot off the gas. But I was thinking, there's no way I'm going to hit 20,000. Because it's not like I'm a Dan Rhodes or something, and I'm putting exposure videos up, and I'm going to get thousands of subs every single day. I'm, I'm after a very niche community. I'm after people within the magic community. Those are the people that I want to watch magic TV. Um, I know that the 8,500 people that have subscribed to Magic TV this year, that's way more than would have subscribed if I have set the goal at 12,000 or 13,000 or 14,000 or 15,000. 
Um, so yeah, you know, uh, the other thing that I would say um, is don't overwhelm yourself. I see so many people that make so many goals. I'm going to do this. 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 They have like a thousand goals. My friend Nemed Phoenix is like this. Nemed is amazing. He really is. And at the beginning of 2022, he set himself a certain amount of goals. And I was like, oh, cool, man. I'm really glad that you're setting these goals. What are they? He then proceeded to hand me a booklet a bound booklet. He'd literally written a 15 page manuscript, but he'd written it, he'd typed it out, he'd set it out, he'd graphic designed it. He'd put it into like a little folder and had it all heat bound and everything. It looked amazing. He'd had his logo put on the front and, and he'd broken his goals down. He had health goals and fitness goals. He had personal goals. He had organizational goals. He had business goals. He had this, he had this, he had this, he had this. As far as I'm aware, I don't think he's hit one of them. Um, and I think it's because every single time he goes to open that bloody booklet, it's like, And it's very easy for him to make an excuse. And I love Nemit a bit, and I'm, I'm, I know he's going to be hitting a lot more goals this year. But one of his big goals was he wanted to set up a YouTube channel. And everything else that he wanted to do was tied into this YouTube channel. So in other words, he wanted to set up a YouTube channel. And then off the back of the YouTube channel, um, he wanted to um, uh, have a million other things that were happening and interviewing people and this and that and the other. And, and, and in order to, to start this, he wanted to hit his health goal, which was going to be at a certain level of weight that he wanted to lose. And so it was all dependent on that and it all got convoluted. And, and, and then he didn't factor in the fact that he got busy doing gigs, which he needed to do in order to, you know, basically be in business. And it ended up being in a situation where he missed pretty much all of his goals. Now he's still done freaking amazing because I know how many his invoices are every single month. Um, so I know he's done well from a business point of view, but I know that he certain, had certain things that he wanted to hit and he hasn't hit. And, and I think it's because he made too many goals. He was too like, it was like, Oh my God, I'm going to, it's almost like overwhelming. Have you ever kind of been in a situation where you kind of like, right, okay, I've got to do this. Holy shit. Where do I start? There's so much that I need to do. And when you look at it and you go, crap, you kind of the easiest solution is to go, hey, let's put that off till tomorrow. I'll just go and play on the PlayStation instead because that's going to be a little bit easier, right? Um, and I think if if you overwhelm yourself with too many goals, if you overwhelm yourself with too many, um, um, too much stuff that you need to do, uh, you end up not doing anything. Um, so within my company, uh, uh, which brings me back to what I was mentioning earlier on, which is from a business point of view, you want to track everything. Now, this is a conversation that I've had with Thomas uh, and Jay, actually, about tracking everything. Uh, and I'm talking about this purely from a business point of view. But from a business point of view, you want to track absolutely everything. And I mean everything. How many inquiries are coming in on a week-by-week -week basis? 52 weeks of the year, week one, 2022. 2023, 2019, whatever. How many inquiries were coming in? Where did those inquiries come from? How many of those inquiries converted into bookings? Out of the ones that did convert into bookings, where did the inquiries initially come from? Um, out of those ones that, uh, uh, ba, 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 out of the ones that, um, um, out of the ones that, um, you know, didn't book in, why did they not book in? What was the reason for them not booking in? Track absolutely everything. Because by tracking everything, it's going to do a few things. And the first thing it's going to do is it's going to help you hit your goals. So what we do, and I'll tell you right now in Nonstop Kids, um, we have goals, admin-related goals. I don't know what the admin-related goals are, to be perfectly honest, because I try not to go into the admin department because it scares me and I don't understand it and it's way too organized. So I tend to keep out of there. But I know that there's goals going on. I just don't have anything to do with them. But uh, the sales department, that's where I'm at, sales and marketing department. And Liz, who's my sales manager, she knows that the goal, the 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 what we our goals for 2024 are going to be 25% higher than what we did in 2023. So in 2023, we and, and we've hit all of our that we've actually hit every, all of our goals in 2023. We hit. We're actually in a situation now where we're uh, we're we're much further along than we were pre-pandemic for both slightly unusual and non-stock kids, which is great. 
um, especially as Slightly Unusual was put on the back burner for a long while while we built up non-stop kids after the pandemic. But 25% higher. So I know the goals are going to be month by month, we're going to be putting 25% onto whatever um, target we hit in 2023. Um, and then we're going to have on the board, we're going to have on the board, uh, there's a big board in the office and we're going to have those targets written down on there on a week by week basis and we're going to be keeping on top of them so me and Liz my sales uh, sales manager in the office we're going to be sitting down every single week and we're going to be going right okay so in order to hit our goals in January 2024 how many inquiries do we need in um, uh, how many how many bookings do we need in um, this first week right that's how many bookings we have to get we have to get that. So that then trickles down to the sales department, it trickles down to Matt, uh, it trickles down to everybody saying, right, okay, these are the amount of bookings that we need to get in 2024. Then um, we go, okay, well, okay, in order to get that many bookings, what's our conversion rate? Well, we know what our conversion rate is because we track it. So that's our conversion rate. So in order to hit that many bookings, how many inquiries do we need to get? Well, we need to get that many inquiries. So then I'm going to the marketing department and saying, right, this is the amount of inquiries we need to get. This has to be an increase on last year by this many in order to hit the target. Sales departments aren't going to be able to hit their targets unless you guys hit your target. So that's where you guys come in. Um, all of this is very, very important. Understanding where you were in order to understand where you need to go. And then what the, the other thing that tracking everything will do is it will allow you to navigate quieter periods. So we know when there's quiet periods within the company. Not in terms of bookings. I don't think there's ever a time where there are where there's le less bookings, um, but we we know that there's quieter periods in terms of um, inquiries. I'll tell you right now. Normally, it's a very quiet period between the twenty third of December and about the third of January. Why? People tend not want to the te people tend to not want to inquire for kids parties over Christmas and the run up to New Year. So we put a ton of adverts out this year. We put a ton of adverts out. We put a ton of um, ads out, online ads. We wrote a bunch of blogs. Uh, we, we did some emails out to our mailing list about the best time to book and the best time to inquire is over the Christmas period where everyone's just chilling around. And I went into the office um, uh, today and uh, we have taken about 15 times more bookings in the last five days than we have at any period in the entire history of the company. Um, people are just booking left, right and centre. We've had multiple inquiries and bookings coming in on Christmas Day. Think about that for a minute. Parents are ringing in and wanting to book a Christmas part, a booking birthday party on Christmas Day. That didn't come as a fluke. That came as a result of us specifically knowing that this was going to be a quiet period and marketing and making sure that we reached our target audience and we use some fear of loss. We're like, hey, you is your child got a birthday in January? Because if they have, we're pretty much full right now because a lot of parents have organized it before Christmas. If you've not organized your child's birthday party and you're planning on leaving it until January, you could very possibly miss out. And then we did the same thing with Slightly Unusual and we talked about corporate events and weddings and so on and so forth. So knowing when those quiet periods are will help you plan for that. And you can only do that if you track absolutely everything. Um, every single measurable statistic that you can track, track it. Track income, track expenses. Make it a regular thing that at the end of every year, you look at your expenses and you reduce your expenses down. Me and Sarah are doing that next week. We're going through everything. Uh, we've already started flicking through it and found five things that we don't need to pay for anymore. Five things that we're paying monthly for um, within our company that we've found cheaper alternatives for. Because don't forget, ultimately, at the end of the day, it's that old expression of turnover is vanity, um, profit is sanity. And what that means is a lot of people, um, we, so you guys know I'm a wrestling fan and um, uh, you'll know that, that we, I don't know how many people are wrestling fans here. I'm a huge wrestling fan. And there's a company at the moment uh, called AEW, All Elite Wrestling. They're a great company. Um, but, and the uh, the guy who runs it, Tony Khan, is a multi-billionaire. Um, and he goes on about 
constantly, oh, AEW are turning over this. They're turning over this. They're, they're turning over this amount of money and this amount of money to make it sound amazing. But the bottom line is, the, you know, the, 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 it's estimated that I think they've made a $150 billion loss last year because it's not about turnover. It's not about turnover. It's not about the amount of money that comes into the company. It's about how much money you're left after your expenses. So you need to track your expenses. Track your track your turnover, absolutely. Track your expenses and then track your profit because there's more, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, any business, it's all about making more money, right? And a lot of people think, right, I need to make more money. How do I make more money? Well, I make more money by booking in more gigs. Well, that's one small way of booking, of making more money. There's lots of other ways of making more money. Like, for example, like I said, just reducing the expenses. You bring your expenses down. Your expenses come down. That means that you're going to ultimately make more money. If you can if you can be booking in the same amount of gigs by dropping those expenses down, brilliant. Or you can take that money that you've saved on dropping the expenses and put it into something like marketing to get more inquiries. How else can you save money? How else can you make more money as a company? Well, you could you could put prices up. I hate putting my uh, my my prices up. I hate it. It scares the hell out of me. Uh, Sarah would do it every single day. Sarah's very ruthless when it comes to that. She's like, right, okay, let's put it up by another 10%. Let's put it up by another 10%. Um, you know, because ultimately at the end of the day, she's like, hey, cost of living, everyone else's prices are going up. Why shouldn't ours? And I'm like, but no, you'll book us. And then she puts the prices up and we still continue having people book us. You know, if you put your prices up um, and you're booking in, if you booked in 10 gigs in the first week of 2023 and you book those same 10 gigs in 2024, but you're charging an extra 30 quid more for the gig, well, you've made a lot more money there, right? Um, um, hey, yeah. When you when you speak of turnover, are you referring to revenue? Income? Yeah, revenue. Sorry, yeah, yeah. We call it turnover in the UK. Yeah, basically okay. how much money your company is bringing in or how much money okay. you are bringing in. Uh, basically from your sales process, yep. how much money that generates. All right. You know, so if you All sell right, sure. if you sell parties like me, how many, how, what's the money that's coming in as a result of all of that sales activity okay. and all of the expenses, you take that off and what you're left with is your gross profit. And yeah. then ultimately we're going to be left with our net profit. We're not going to get into that right now because that's a whole kind of worms. But um, the point I'm trying to make is it's really important to think about, think about how you can make more money within the company. And sometimes, you know, um, <laughs> I get it a lot. Um you know, you must have seen it. You must have seen it on Magic TV or somebody. When I get into an argument with somebody on, on, on the Internet, the first thing they'll say is Craig's money motivated. Well, one, I'm not really money motivated because I don't need to be. Frankly, without being funny, I don't need to be money motivated. But the other thing is being money motivated is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, I, I, Yeah, you don't want to be, you know, I've got a friend who... um. Uh, but, but my ex-business partner, in actual fact, is very money motivated and he does stuff that I would completely disagree with. Um, and, and, and you know, I think that you can be too money motivated. But when you're running a business, you know, figuring out ways to make more profit is not necessarily a dirty word. It's not necessarily a bad thing. One thing that you should do is the MD or the CEO. And let's be honest, if you, you are self-employed, you are the MD, you are the CEO of your own company then you need to figure out more ways to become more profitable. Because if you're not profitable, you don't have a business. You have a paid hobby and it's not even paying that much. So you need to figure out ways of, of, of being profitable. And, and like I say, reducing expenditure, expenditure, increasing your prices, booking in more gigs, um, trying to increase um, the amount of um, bookings that come in without actual marketing um, without actually uh, spending any marketing. So I'll give you an example. One thing that we do in Nonstop Kids is we have a, a feedback spreadsheet that comes out. We have a feedback spreadsheet that goes out to um, every single client. So if you book us, you get a feedback spreadsheet. And they they fill in this, uh, sorry, this feedback form. They fill in the form and they rate the entertainer on a bunch of different things. How fun were they? How professional were they? A whole bunch of different stuff. And then the bottom question is, would you recommend us to a friend, yes or no? And if they say no, it goes to the operations department because that's something that we want to uh, feed back on and we want to kind of uh, liaise with the customer to find out what's going on. But if they say yes, 
they're going to get a follow-up sales email and this happens automatically within the company but they automatically get triggered a day later a sales email and the sales email says very very simply um thanks very much for booking us for 2000 and uh, thanks very much for booking us for your child's party we're super happy to hear that you would recommend us to a friend uh we're super happy to hear that you enjoyed the party thank you very much uh obviously your child is going to have a party again next year and every year we put our prices up so by the time your child's party comes up next year we are going to be more expensive however what we would like to do as a thank you for booking us this year is um, if you uh, book us right now and pay the deposit right now um, or within seven days um, for a party in, in the future, within the next 12 months, we will, we will freeze our prices for you and you can book the party in at the same price that you paid this year. If you leave it, you will be paying more. Now, that email goes out automatically to every single person that's booked us. And we know one thing, that kids' parties, they're going to have a, that kid's going to have a party next year. And we're speaking to parents who loved us because they've filled in a feedback form. So do you think that they're going to turn around and go, hey, that's a really good idea. All we're asking for is a deposit. It goes on to say, you don't even need a venue. We can put the venues to be confirmed. Just give us the date, give us the time, blah, 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 blah. Well, now that's a great way. You know, I can't tell you the amount of extra bookings we have come in that way. It's a great way to get more bookings. And again, you know, one thing that you need to do within a business is you need to think about cash flow. You know, you need to have that cash in the bank to cash flow to pay for all of your expenses and stuff. A great way to have cash flow is to get deposits for, for events that are coming in in six months time, a year's time, two years time. And this is a great way to uh, increase profit because you're booking more people in and you're booking people in that wouldn't necessarily, you know, in a year's time, their kid might have changed that, you know, that kid might want a bowling party or something else. But by locking us in, that's what they're going to have because they've paid a non-refundable deposit. And they're incentivized to do it because we've frozen the prices at the same level as 2023 um, or 2022, whenever the email went out. Um, it's little things like that. But the key thing is to treat your business like a business and understand that you need to track everything in order to make sure that you're more profitable. That should always be your ultimate goal. Make sure that you're turning over more, you're becoming more profitable, and you're constantly thinking of ways to increase the amount of uh, money that's coming into your business. I've got more to say, but Thomas has put his hand up. Yes, Thomas. By the way, before Thomas um, speaks, are you guys finding this interesting? This is very different to what I normally talk about. Are you okay? Okay, good, good, good. Don't want to bore the hell out of you. Yes, Thomas. <laughs> um, I really like that formula. I didn't know that you did that. I, I, cause I, I get the feedback forms all the time, which scare me every time I get one. But um, um, <laughs> uh, no, um, is there a way of doing that formula for weddings? Because they've not got that the next year. But is there a way of sending them something? Yes, to, yes. It, because I really like that. Yeah, you can. You can. Um, um, you can. You can. Um, you can send them an email to say that you'll freeze. Yeah, with with weddings, I'd do it like this. I'd say, look, thanks very much for your feedback. I'm really glad that you enjoyed me performing at your wedding. Um, I tend to put my prices up year on year. However, what I'd like to do is give you a chance to book me at any point in the next two years. Uh, or you could say three years, whatever you want to do, it's up to you. Uh, book me any any time in the next two, three years for the same package, but I'll freeze my prices for you. So in other words, if you decided to use my services in 2026, you wouldn't be paying 2026 prices, you'd be paying the prices that you've just paid. And you could use this for anything. You could use it for a christening you know, for when you have your first child, you could use it for a, a, a private party, a Christmas gathering, you could even gift it to a colleague if you want to, um, or, or, or something like that. And we don't do that with slightly unusual, but I think it would work within your business. But yeah. I think you just kind of say, you can use it for any event. And I think it'd be um, the key thing would be communicating with them that's that close up magic is something that works for so many different events. Yeah, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna do that. I like that. I do like that idea. Um, thank you. More than welcome. No problem. And uh, I think we've got a question from Chris. Hey, Chris. What you got? 
Hey, uh, mine's more of a comment on that formula. I love the idea of buying out or having them buy out in the future because per your point earlier, if you are tracking all your expenses, that even goes down to the cost of a show. You know what consumables you use in that show, mm -hmm. travel and all that, you can buy ahead. So it helps you plan out a year's in advance. If you know you have you know 35 of this kind of a birthday party, you can go ahead and stock up when you see the opportunity from a manufacturer or from a source uh, for whatever you may use in that show, that all adds into your bottom line as well. And you can save up uh, going ahead and plan ahead. And that all rolls back into that bottom line thing. Uh, and, and that net profit that you try to squeeze so much out of, that's a good way to do it. So I love Absolutely. that idea. And, and the other thing with it as well is you're communicating with the client just when they love you the most. Mm -hmm. They're having they're having all of their guests tell you how amazing the entertainment was. They're super high. They're really happy. Now is the time to communicate and offer something to that client because now that is the time when their impulse to make a kind of a decision like that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeremy. How you doing, buddy? Sorry, I had to unmute there. Uh, hey, Craig, I had a quick question about the the feedback forms. Yes. Uh, so a couple questions, I guess. One, are the feedback forms different for slightly unusual versus the speaking versus the, uh, yes. the nonstop kids? And is there a way to get a copy of those just to kind of look at it and see what kind of questions you're asking? Because I'd be yeah. interested in like what you have for slightly do. unusual. Yeah, I can do. Um, I can I can do a. What I'll do is I'll do a course on this for um, the silver level and get it up for the next upload. And I'll I'll have those feedback forms as downloadable things. They're all very very simple. But the key thing is what you do with it. Oh my God, my mm. Mac is about to die. Do not go anywhere. I just need to plug this thing in. Hang on. Right. Yeah. The key thing is what you do with it. Um, what I mean by that is. Um, you know that if somebody fills in a feedback form, they're super motivated, they're super happy. So that's the time when you want to reach out to them, get them to do something. Now, it could be uh, wanting them to book for the following year. But I tell you what it could be. If you put something into the feedback form that says, hey, and we have this, can you describe what you thought of the event? And you get them to write a couple of words like the entertainer was fabulous, blah, 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 blah whatever it may be. You then send them a you then send them an email saying thanks so much for your feedback. Super excited that you uh, you like you like the event. Thank you very much. Um, you know we live and die by word of mouth, and reviews are very important to us. Here's a link to Google. Here's a link to Facebook. Here's a link to Trustpilot. Here is what you said in your in your in your feedback to us, and you just literally put that in the body of the thing. And then you say, hey, if you could just copy and paste that review and put it on um, those platforms, it will take 10 seconds. Just click on the link and you put a link directly through to where they leave the review. So it's not a link to Google. It's a link to the Google reviews for your company. So they literally just have to go click, paste, done, click, paste, done, click, paste, done. You've now got reviews for all three of those. And that's the time to do it because they're super happy. They have filled up a feedback form. They want to help you. Then's the time to do it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So yeah, that but yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that um for the next upload. No problem. Yeah, yeah. I'm just kind of curious what, what you what you asked for. Yeah, sure. It's um we're slightly unusual, it's uh puncture because it's slightly different for us because obviously we're dealing with an agency. So we need yeah. to know that the entertainers or the magicians that were going out and performing for us were doing the right thing. So there's questions that you wouldn't ask for you uh, for an individual. So we're asking about punctuality and, um, you know, professionalism and a bunch of stuff like that, um, which you probably wouldn't want to ask if you weren't running an agency. Um, but there's a bunch of stuff that we do ask that would be uh, would be good for you to ask. So, I'll, yeah, I'll put those all together for you. No problem. I can't exactly remember what all the questions were because I set up the automated system um, 10 years ago. I've got my email up. The f I don't know if they're different, but um, professionalism, punctuality, friendliness, how fun were they, and feedback. Yeah, that's for nonstop kids. Slightly unusual, slightly different. Is it I, that different? Yeah, slightly unusual has got different questions. Um, I don't think you've ever had any good feedback for slightly unusual because you're pretty shit. So that's probably why you've never. <laughs> I've never, honestly, I've never had feedback from slightly unusual. I don't think we send it from slightly unusual. We send yeah. the entertainers feedback for nonstop kids. We don't tend to do it for slightly unusual, but that's something that's changing in the new year. Yeah. 
that and you're not really shit not that much so i don't know i had a lot of footballers telling me i'm shit and i know i am <laughs> that's hilarious um yeah so uh, any other questions on on any of that at that point okay so the other thing that i would say um and the biggest thing that i think that you can do in order to help you hit your goals and i'm slightly deviating but i think it's just as important and it's the thing that i think a lot of business owners not just magicians but business owners in general i think they don't do and i think it's the thing that i've done if I could pinpoint one thing that I've done that's helped me be more successful than I was when I started this journey, it's the ability or the willingness to take risks. Um, and I think that's very important. Have I ever told you about my Aladdin story? No? Okay, so basically... Um, <laughs> so here you go. Buckle in. This is a good one. So um, this story illustrates the importance of taking risks and uh all of this is true it's not going to sound true but genuinely it really is and um so 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 basically the, the, this story starts very shortly after um me and uh i decided that sarah came back and told me that she was pregnant and so i was very very quickly i think ryan had just no ryan hadn't been born so it was it was it was very quickly shortly afterwards where I was told to sort my shit out by Sarah. So I think I'd left the magic community. I quit the wizard product review, but I don't think I had figured out what to do. And my business partner at the time was Russell Leeds, um, who who a very good magician, and me and Russ got along really well, but neither one of us were great business people. And and I had a background in marketing. My background's in marketing, but 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 that did not translate to business at all. And I remember having a conversation with Russ. We met up every single day to try and run our business. And um, I remember having a conversation with Russ. And the conversation that I had was I figured out how to be really successful as magicians. And and he said how. And I said I've done a competitor analysis, which I did. And I think that's a really important thing to do, do a competitor analysis, figure out what the market's doing and what the market's not doing. So I did a competitor analysis and I realized that very few people in the UK were doing illusion shows. There were just no illusion shows going on. It was all close-up magicians. It was all close-up magicians and it was all kids entertainers and nobody was doing illusion shows. And I said to Russ, I said, if we do, if we offer an illusion act, there's going to be so much work there. We're going to have more work than ever before because there's very few illusion acts. But also, I think that people will actually look at us on a different level. If we can say that we're going out and doing an illusion show, people will look at us as bigger than we are. Now, all of that is true, and that actually does happen. The amount of times I get booked for a close-up job and I go, I ask where to get changed, and they go, oh, yeah, in the disabled toilets. And then I go and do a gig, and I'm part of Slightly Unusual. And I go, oh, where can I get changed? And they go, oh, we've got a green room for you. And by the way, there's a menu in there. Please order whatever you want to. Uh, you've got a bar, an open bar. You know, it's like they treat you with more respect as an illusionist. They really do. Um, probably because they're spending more. Probably because, I don't know, whatever. So I was like, we need to be an illusion act. And Russ pointed out the one obvious problem with my plan, which was neither one of us knew how to do illusions. Um, don't know how to do illusions. Don't know, don't, didn't know anything about it. I could do card tricks, could do a double lift, wouldn't have a clue how to even do it. Wouldn't even know how an illusion worked. And I was like, okay, well, someone's got to know. So I did, I did the logical thing. I did the thing. I, I was very, um, I was very methodical about this and I Googled it. And um, I realized, you know, Google didn't show up all of the amazing illusion builders that I now use in the UK. No, no, it showed up all the American ones. And um, and I, I went back to Russ and I was like, um, uh, I've figured out how we can be an illusion act. And he's like, oh, brilliant. How can we do it? I'm like, well, all we need is this, 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 this from this website. And he was like, okay, how much is that? And I was like, um, about 15,000 pounds. And he's like, it was about 15 to 18,000 pounds. And he's like, yeah, but we haven't got 15 or 18,000 pounds. I was like, I know, I've got a plan. Um, and he's like, what's the plan? I was like, right, I'm gonna ask Sarah to lend me the money. 
And because Sarah was a deputy head, she had lots of money. I was like, I'll just get Sarah to lend me the money. So I, uh, I, I, I said to Sarah, hey, you know, you told me to sort my shit out. I'm, I'm going to be an illusionist. And she gave me that look of despair and disgust and, you know, the, the, the look that's reserved for your husband when uh, he's talking bollocks. And, uh, and I said, there's only one small problem. Um, I need some money. And she went, how much? And I told her. Now, a couple of minutes later, when she picked herself up off the floor, um, she, um, she said no understandably and um and so i did something um because sarah don't forget i was a self-employed magician my credit rating didn't exist it was in the toilet i had no credit rating you rang up Experian and they laughed at me um however i did know that sarah had an amazing credit rating because she'd been employed a whole life and was a good little girl and um so i um i uh <clears throat> borrowed her credit card and uh, and 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 put eighteen thousand pounds worth of illusions on the credit card, and uh, she didn't know for about two or three months because the uh, bank statements just didn't get delivered for a while. Don't know why. Um, so um, she found out and and obviously almost divorced me, but didn't. But what I didn't realize is how long it was going to take to come. Um, it was gonna. It was three and a half months to all of these because they were all made. And then shipped over to the UK. So it's three and a half months. So she found out shortly before um, they got delivered into, into, into the UK. And she um, she said, well, you better make this work because I'm furious. And I was like, oh, my God, this is the biggest risk I've taken in my life. I'm putting my marriage on the rocks here. OK, I can I can make this work. Now, I'd not thought this through. And I didn't realize just how fucking big illusions are. Like, I've got a warehouse full of that shit, right? They are massive, massive. However big you think it is running an illusion act, it's bigger. And I didn't even realize that. And I had illusion arriving day marked on my calendar where I knew all of the illusions were arriving. Now, me and Sarah uh, live in a nice house, but it's not the biggest house in the world. It's got a very big back garden, but it's not it's not massive. Um, and... Um, um, not a big not a big road either it's like a little village um and when i saw the articulated lorry driving up the road um uh, with nothing but massive wooden boxes all for us that i realized that i'd made a massive mistake um and uh all of these boxes the guy knocked on the door and he's like where do you want them and i'm like <laughs> put them in the back garden i got no else to put it, stick them in the back garden and and, and it, it was like the TARDIS just more stuff kept coming out of this van I'm like like I'm pretty sure I didn't have this much like it was just ridiculous um and I remember getting on the phone to Russ and, and Sarah wasn't around when they arrived I remember getting on the phone to Russ and saying Russ you might want to you might want to get yourself uh, get, can you go over and get like some sort of, sort of gazebo thing or something because it's going to rain later and this stuff's going to get soaked it, it, I've got nowhere to put it it's got to be the it's got to be the back garden so um they, they they were all in the back garden and Sarah came home and 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 didn't talk to me for about four days um and we had to figure out somewhere to put them so we I begged a friend of mine who ran a graphic design company and had a big warehouse at the back to let us like put them in there while we figured out what we were going to do and then the next problem occurred in that uh, got, there were a couple of problems that happened very shortly thereafter the first problem was I didn't realize that these illusions don't come with instructions there's no tutorial link when you buy an illusion, it doesn't come with instructions. Did you not know that? Did No, I didn't know that. Don't know if you knew that. You buy a fucking 5,000 pound metal box. You'd think somebody would tell you how to use it. No, no. They assume that you know. I didn't know. So there's me like with all of these boxes and I'm like, what am I meant to do with this? Some phone calls to people like Mike Michaels a little while later and I actually figured it out. And then the next problem occurred, which is... Um, you need a van to car to get this stuff from A to B. Like, you can't do an illusion act without a van. I don't even drive. Russell drove a little Skoda. Like, we couldn't even get one of the tiny little boxes in the back of there, so we didn't have a van. So we had to then, like, look into getting a van. And then the biggest problem was you need a girl to put in the box. Well, I mean, we've transcended to Ryland now. You, you, if you've got a Ryland, you can put a Ryland in the box. But at the time, we didn't have a Ryland. Uh, we had, we, and we didn't have a girl. We needed a girl to put in the box. So we didn't have a girl either. We, we roped um, um, 
Russ's wife into jumping in the box. And she wasn't a natural assistant by any stretch of imagination, but it was literally the best that we had. So um, we we're putting, we we're rehearsing every single day, like every day for about 10 hours a day, we we're rehearsing and rehearsing and rehearsing. And then we had a, I had a phone call and God alone knows how this person found me because marketing was something that we hadn't really done much of at all. Um, and, but we had a phone call from this person who was the PA of this millionaire, billionaire, um, who said, oh, it's my, um, it's, it's uh, my, I'm ringing. Are you, do you do illusion? Are you an illusion act? Yeah. 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 That's us. We do, we do illusions. We're an illusion act. Okay, cool. Um, so we want to, um, we, we, we want to speak to you because uh, my my uh, my boss's daughter is having her ninth birthday and and she wants to have an illusion act and the, the theme is Aladdin so we need an Aladdin themed birthday um party all based around uh Aladdin with illusions can you do that um and I was like yep yeah. Yep, I can do that. Yep, that sounds fine. That's not a problem at all. To give you an idea of how rich this person was, they'd already booked the, 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 the singer, and it was the people that were actually appearing on Broadway at the time. They were flying over to literally just do this party. Like, it was insane. So they were like, okay, well, we want to speak to you. Um, I, I, me and my team want to speak to you because this has to be right. Could you come and have a meeting in central London at, at, at the house? And I was thinking, me and Russ were broke. We had no money at all. I, I don't even think we had enough money to get petrol there. And I was like, um, yeah, obviously it's it's quite a, a distance for us to get to London. And she was like, oh, we'll 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 pay you to come for the meeting. And I was like, oh right, okay. She said, will will, will a thousand pounds do? Um, yep. Yeah. That'd be good. Yep. Yep. We'll be there. We'll be there. We'll be there. Not a problem. I just made more money than any gig that I'd ever done for just turning up to a meeting. This was ridiculous. So me and Russ went down to London and you know, like you go to these places and they have massive driveways. This guy had his own village in central London. Like we, we th there were people driving around in golf carts. Like there were like, it was a big, massive gated thing with about 20 different buildings. And we went past like five of the biggest buildings that you'd ever seen. And then we got to this massive mansion that was just for this person that I was speaking to. It wasn't even the family. It was a mansion that he gave to her and her family. Like it was just insane. So we went in there and me and Russ had spoken about this beforehand. And we were like, right, OK, this could be really big for us. Up until that point we charged like probably a hundred quid for a gig. We just didn't have a clue what we were doing. We charged literally nothing, but we also were aware, we weren't stupid. We were aware that she'd, she'd charged, a th she'd given us a thousand pounds to turn up for a meeting. So we knew we had to charge more. So we were like, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to quote like more. We, we, we both sat down and thought about it and we're like, right, okay, we'll charge two grand. That, that'd be amazing if we got across two grand two grand right okay so they were having the meeting and and she was asking us questions and i i i was bullshitting like i'd never bullshitted before like i was just talking so much crap like just desperately trying to get this gig and she was buying it she thought we were like david copperfield reincarnated like she thought it was like oh my god this is amazing and then it came to the question um she was like how much is it going to cost and I was sitting, she was there, there was a desk, and I was sitting next to Russ. And, I, I, you know, me and Russ haven't spoken for years. He's gone his own way, I've gone my own way. But at the time, we were like best friends. And you know when you've got somebody who you're really good friends with, and you can just look at them and you instantly know exactly what they're thinking and they know what you're thinking. We almost had a telepathic conversation. Because she asked this question, I looked at Russ as if to say, you take this one. And, and he looked back to me as if to say, there's no fucking chance, you're going to have to do it. And I was like, right, okay. So I was like, well, I was about to go, we were thinking 2,000 pounds. And before I could say anything, she was saying, yeah, for the half an hour show, including everything, we're looking about, you know, we'd be looking to pay you about 25,000 pounds. Would that be okay? I couldn't breathe. I couldn't speak. 
I'm pretty sure Ross lost the ability to speak as well. And we just looked at each other and looked back at her and went, just couldn't speak like it was the most insane conversation ever and then she said she, the icing on the cake she was like by the way we're thinking of having it in the garage um you know we're gonna we're gonna have a, a, a team of decorators come in and turn the garage into agrabah i was like this is a big illusion act i don't think it's gonna work in a garage and she was like come with me so then we sat on her little golf cart drove five minutes to the other side of the compound and went into this garage Every single sports park car you could possibly imagine. Every single, like, there were like 40 cars in there. She's like, oh, we're going to take them out and put them in a garage number two. Garage number two? We're going to put them in garage number, there's a second garage? There's another one? All right. Okay. Yeah, whatever. Um, so, and we had two and a half weeks to put this together, by the way. Two and a half weeks to script an entire show. Um <laughs> And I've got the uh, showreel somewhere, <laughs> as you can see. Two and a half weeks to put this act together. Luckily, we were, you know, we'd got so many illusions. We'd figured out we had tip over tip over trunks. So we wait, we worked out a way of making the birthday kid appear on stage. They wanted us to do it all to music, but have the story there as well. And they wanted the singers from the West End musical to actually sing the songs live as we were doing the illusions and. You know, she wanted the birthday kid to appear and all of this crazy shit. Um, and, and we thought the best way to do it was to actually tell the story of Aladdin. So um, that's what we did. And there were three of us telling the story of Aladdin. And so uh, Russ, who was, you know, quite young, 21 years old, 22 years old, blonde hair. He, he took on the role of Aladdin. Uh, his wife, Anna, she took on the role of Princess Jasmine, obviously. And then that left me. And I had to be the genie. And uh, uh, I, 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 so I, um, I was a lot bigger then than I am now. Like I, I, I then lost a lot of weight. I put some on over in COVID. I'm trying to lose it again now, but I was probably twice the size back then as I was now. I looked like a fucking walking bad to gattle. And um, the worst thing that could happen to any woman ever happened to Anna when we knew that we had to have me bloom. Couldn't figure out a way of doing it, so she sat backstage because she did a bit of face painting. She sh she sat, uh, sat backstage for two hours before the show, body painting me blue from head to toe. It's not an experience I'd wish on any woman. Um, and we got these giant red shorts. Um, I kind of looked a little bit like MC Hammer. You can't touch me. Nobody would want to touch it, to be honest. It was, it was the, the most gross thing that you've ever seen. And we did it, and we did the whole show, and somehow we managed to pull it off. And then they paid us. The, they paid us in cash, which is just insane. So they gave us this massive, massive, all 50 pound notes. And, um, and afterwards, I kind of sat down and I thought about that. And the moral of the story, there is a moral for this incredibly long story. And the moral of the story is this, twofold. Number one, in this story... I probably took the biggest risk I have in my entire life. I literally put my marriage on the rocks in order to do something that I felt was the right thing to do. Doing an illusion show has put Slightly Unusual on the map. It has literally taken me around the world. And we are probably one of about six touring illusion acts in the UK. Um, and those doors would never have opened if I hadn't set up an illusion show. And it was a massive risk buying those illusions and putting ourselves massively in debt to do it. But it paid off. And if you actually think about it, the illusions were about £18,000 all in. And we got paid £25,000 for the gig. The gig covered everything that we paid on the illusions and then some. But the thing is, if I hadn't have taken that risk and bought those illusions, I couldn't have taken that gig. Those illusions took three and a half months to get into the UK. I had two, three weeks to organize that party if if uh, if she came knocking on the door i couldn't have blagged my way into it and said yeah yeah and bought the illusions it couldn't have happened the only way i was able to do it is because i took the risk in the first place um and and it paid off and and i think that's the most important thing i think that a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of business owners and a lot of magicians they're scared of taking risks they're scared of taking risks they don't want to upset the status quo and you know i've always been of the belief and the mindset of I would rather look back at a situation 
And I would rather look back and go, well, I gave it my best shot than, oh, I wish I had. I don't want to look back and go, oh, my life would have worked out if I'd have done that or if I'd have done that or if I'd done that. I want to take every opportunity. And look, here's the thing. Has every single risk I've taken paid off? No. I have fallen flat on my face more times than I care to admit. However, has a, 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 I would not be where I am now if I hadn't taken any risks. If I played it safe my entire career, I would be still working at NPower, knocking on people's doors, trying to sell them gas and electric, because just the fact of leaving my job and deciding to become a full-time magician and telling my boss to shove his job up his ass. True story, I did that. That was super fun. Um, you know, just, just the act of doing that is a massive risk. And if I'd have ne never taken a risk, I, I never would be a full-time magician. If I'd have never taken a risk, I wouldn't have set up Magic TV. Sitting, setting up a third company in the middle of a pandemic when you're, you know, not getting any work and you're getting more and more in debt is stupid. Um, I wouldn't be releasing tricks. There'd be no magic coming out. There wouldn't be a slightly unusual. There wouldn't be a nonstop kids. This wouldn't exist if I had played it safe. So, you know, when you're thinking about setting your goals, think about taking risks. Look at every situation that comes your way and ask yourself a question. This is the question I always ask myself these days. Ask yourself this question. What is the worst case scenario? A situation falls into your lap and you can either take it or not take it. What's the worst case scenario? If everything goes wrong, if everything goes tits up, what's the worst case scenario? And then ask yourself a question, what's the best case scenario? And then ask yourself a question, what's the most likely scenario? And if you can live with the worst case scenario, if the worst case scenario won't kill you and you can live with it, then go for it. Because the old bottom line is it could catapult you into the next level. But it won't if you don't take that risk. If you play it safe, like a lot of magicians do, I guarantee you that you won't be where ultimately you want to be. And the other thing that I learned from that whole situation is the importance of putting your prices up. I talked about putting prices up earlier on. I still struggle with this. And Sarah's the one that always drives that forward every year. I always struggle with it. But then I think back to this. Before I did that gig, I was paying, I was charging a hundred quid for a gig, hundred quid for a gig. That's it. That's how I'm charged. I was going out as Specky the Clown. Um, then I did a gig where I pay it, where I got paid 25,000 pounds for 30 minutes. And you know what? Off the back of that, I had all of those millionaires that were in that room contacting me and saying, Hey, can you do my event? Can you do my event? Can you do my event? What was the difference between the person they were contacting to do that event and the person who was going out as Specky the Clown? There was no difference. There was no difference at all. I was the same person. It was still me. There was no difference at all. What the difference was, was mindset. I decided that I was worth more. I decided that my fee was worth more. And I just decided to put my fee up. And was I losing gigs? Yes. But was I getting higher priced gigs? Yes. And again, it was a risk. And it was a risk that paid off. Now, there's no harm in playing, you know, I mean, the advantage that some people have got in this call is like Thomas, for example, you 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 have the amazing opportunity of working with nonstop kids and slightly unusual, which means that because you've got that level of work that you know is always going to be there, it's not even too much of a risk for you to put your prices up. Because no, I've already decided, I was talking to the wife the other day that we're, we're putting our prices up next year. Yeah, because, because the bottom I'm... line is if you don't get, the, if you don't, if they turn around to you and say no, you're still going to get a full time work for months. So, huh? yeah. You'll fill my calendar if I don't. Exactly. So there's no risk, really. And that's what I mean. You look at the best case scenario, you look at the worst case scenario, and then you decide. So, yeah, that's a, a quite a long story, but it's it's it's, it's a choice. I actually, I actually use um, Slightly Unusual as non-stop kids to uh, pressure the sale as well. Uh, so... After when they make the inquiry, if I don't hear anything from them, and I'll say, uh, I've, um, my agents put a, I, I class you as an agent, by the way. Oh, that's cool. um, yeah. When I'm talking to the um, client, I said, my agent's got me a gig, he's booked it on this day, might be able to get rid of it if he's got another magician that can cover it. Are you sure? 
you know, and then I bullshit, I bullshit, bullshit, and they go, oh, yeah, best guy. I went, well, let me get back to it. Let me give me agent a call. See if I can get rid of it. And then bang, and yeah, it works. It's really good. <laughs> so there you go. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, uh, any questions on any of that? I mean, does that all make sense? Does that, um, you know, I kind of, I, I, I kind of went on a bit of a diversion, so it wasn't just <laughs> about, about about goal setting. But I think goal setting and and taking risks go hand in hand. And um, you know, we've all got stuff. And and the other thing is, don't put off stuff that you could be doing. Um, there's, we've all got stuff that we could be doing that we put off. I do that all of the time. Everyone does. Um, you know, I'm, uh, uh, there's, uh, you know, uh, it could be, you know, improving your website. It could be, um, you know, putting that new show together. It could be whatever it is. Don't put it off, you know, factor that into whatever goals that you're setting. You know, don't, you, you don't just make it a specific goal, but say, right, okay, like me. You know, twenty. Uh, my goal was to do twenty thousand subs by the end of this year. I've hit eighteen thousand nine hundred. Cool. Um, what did I have to do to get to that point? What did I have to do? What could I have done? So it's all kind of built in together. You know, um, very very important. Um, but has anybody got any other questions on anything to do with goal setting? No, I was thinking about this raising prices piece, Craig, mm -hmm. and uh, that's something I keep doing is just pushing. And one thing I've noticed is you probably, I think you and I kind of spoke about this a little bit. One of the things I noticed is I'll get a call from somebody and I go that much for that much time. I go, yeah, well, that, you're probably saying that because you're not my target audience. You're, you're over here, but the people that, that do call me, they go, oh yeah, no problem. They don't even ask for price. They just ask for availability, which is something we worked on with setting everything up. So when they call you, they don't, price isn't even the question. They just say, yeah. are you available? And so we've gotten that. And that's so why I was like, to people, yeah. If if some if when you get people calling you, if they're saying all of the time, I want to know your availability, and they're not asking about price, it means that you've got your social proof in place. It means that you've got your website in place. You've got your copy in place because they're buying into you. They don't care yeah. about anything else. They want to know your availability. It, but if they're calling and they're asking about price, what's your cheapest price? How much is your quote? That's the first question they come with. They're not sold on you. So your marketing strategy or marketing activity is not working because if it was, they wouldn't be, you know, they, they, yeah. they would be, um, yeah. When I find one of the best ways is this uh, word of mouth kind of piece as well, because it seems like every gig that I do, somebody asks for my card and then that turns into something. It's starting to kind of snowball this kind of effect. And then so I'm shoving, so what, what I was thinking about doing for this new year is really kind of honing in on packages as a goal. Uh, because I mean, just the 30 minutes I'm going to charge for like the 30 minutes close-up show i'm going to charge a fair amount because i feel like the people i want to work for won't hire me if i don't charge a certain amount i need a certain kind of at least base price uh to get into this crowd and uh just listen to what you're saying like some of the some of these people like 25 quids or, or dollars i don't know how the money works there but uh twenty five thousand is a lot to throw around and if you have enough money where that's just like yeah sure whatever I mean, those people will not pay hire you if you only charge, you know, two thousand dollars. Exactly. Yeah. Like I I see the amount of money that like people want to. Um, um, uh, uh, I see the amount of money that people want to pay. Yeah. For somebody like Ryland, and it's like you know you 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 have that television experience, and you have that you know going on TV, you can stick an extra zero on your your, your quote. Well, you know, and that was one thing I was wanting to really start pushing this pickpocketing stuff a little bit in a new year. But I feel like the pick, a pickpocketing act is almost like juggling. You know, after you watch a little bit of it, it's kind of like, all right, that's enough. You know, like if you were to juggle for just 10 minutes, it's, it's got to be entertaining. And one of the theories, one of the, one of the things that they say in juggling is to uh, make a 10 minute act and then squeeze it to two minutes. And that'll make it entertaining and exciting. And so I was thinking a pickpocketing act, you know, probably doesn't need to be over like eight minutes long that's including yeah. what you say what you do if, if that's if you're only doing that and so i was trying to figure out how because i want to set goals to really start pushing that piece and i'm going to sell like the eight to ten minute like you can hire me just to come in for like eight to ten minutes just to do a pickpocketing act you just come up on stage i do this i pull people up boom we got a whole thing and then uh but if you want more here's also what i can do i can offer offer strolling or a close-up act or i can offer these kind of pieces so you start building in those those pieces 
Um, but that's gonna have a base price. I'm, I'm not gonna charge cheap to go on stage to do pickpocketing. I mean, that's kind of, that's a specialty thing. So uh, anyway, so I was, if you have any advice on like setting goals for those kind of things and how to, what, what like next steps would be, how to kind of push those things forward, I'd love to. Yeah, so, like so sort of offering stage shows and offering this and offering that and offering, offering other packages, higher price packages. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, the, the, I always say the first thing that you should do ideally in an ideal world is be able to show that you can do that stuff so yeah, what i mean sure. by that is if you're wanting to like, for argument's sake let's say you wanted to do a stage performance piece with pickpocketing for example okay. just for argument's sake yeah you'd need some video on that you know okay. because because the problem is anybody can set themselves up to be an expert but in this day and age everybody proof. is yeah it's 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 zero uh the content marketing association call this zero points which basically means that these days if somebody's searching for something they're going to research into it uh and i i talk about this all the time you know like when when a new magic trick comes out you probably just don't rush out and buy it straight away at the very hmm. least you probably look at the reviews on the site that you're actually looking at it on but then you're probably going to be checking out um online magic reviewers you're going to be looking at forums maybe facebook you're going to be checking out reviewers you're going to see if that thing is as good as it says it is uh, especially if you're paying a high price for something right I mean, it's mm -hmm. the same with 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 this anytime you add something new you want to make sure that you can prove that you can do that um okay. Uh, you know, I, I think that that social proof is very important. So before yeah. you start, so a goal would be put yourself into a position where you're able to offer that. You know, the goal shouldn't be, right, how am I going to start offering it? The goal, yeah. should, you, you lay the foundations first of all. So the foundations need to be laid initially and then you can then, let, you know, build up the rest of the thing and let people in. So the goal should be, right, in, in three months' time, in six months' time, I'm going to have, uh, I'm going to have done a gig, I'm going to have it filmed. I'm going to have a show reel. I'm going to have some photos, I'm going to have a couple of reviews, I'm going to have the ad copy written, I'm going to be in a situation where I'm actually talking about this thing so that, um, so that I, can, I, can, I can then put myself as an authority on this subject. Okay. Um, and that that works in it's not just gigs it's it, every aspect of business um that's that makes sense yeah so like, maybe uh, maybe my goal is to just go get this video not yeah, that video yeah so it's sure specifically it. for the pickpocketing piece yeah I absolutely i would yeah. literally and you know what i'd consider maybe even having a separate website set up at some point um which is like you, you think know, so pick, possibly but but what you do it because some people are going to be so I, you don't have to, but what I would do in this situation is I would have something like, um, a, if you really go big on the pickpocketing, have a pickpocketing section on your website, mm. but when they click on that, there's a link that takes them to, to a specific website about the pickpocketing. Okay. Um, and you've got a separate website just about the, a one very clean one page website just set up to promote that because then you can build on the SEO specifically for that website as well. So, oh, that's a good point. yeah, so I, I would do that if it's going to go going to be a big thing for you moving forward. I would consider doing that. Like that's what I do. Um, I have slightly unusual, but when people look for me specifically, it takes them through to my website specifically for me as a performer. Um, and and they get taken away from slightly unusual and to me. Hmm. So. Okay, no, that's good. Thanks. That helps. Hey.